Good afternoon, everyone. Um, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Jackson Taylor, and I direct the prison writing program at Penn. And I wanted to welcome you to this afternoon's panel, which is called Frozen in Time, Racist Traditions and the Prison System. And the title actually came from a quote that Susan Rosenberg, one of our committee members, met, mentioned at a meeting once, and she said that in committing a crime, you're frozen in time for the rest of your life for that one moment in time. And it's very hard to overcome that. And it's not like we just woke up and said, oh my goodness, look at the racist problem in prison. It's been visible and spoken about for quite some time. But in the past five years or so, I would say I've begun to notice the conversation changing. And there's suddenly a lot of literature available on the subject with uh, pretty good evidence um, as to how this, this is happening. So I'm going to keep our, our introductions very brief for the panelists. And I'm going to introduce them by title only when, they, when it's their turn to speak. And if they would like to amend something about their own work or about the organization, I'm going to ask them to do that and because they will know more pertinently what they want to stress. And the, these are four panelists with incredible resumes, incredible backgrounds, um, and we're very lucky to have them on stage at the same time. And I want to make sure that we give them as much time to say what they need to say. So we're going to begin with Sophia Elijah, who is the executive director of the Correctional Association of New York. And maybe just say a couple of sentences about what that organization does. Thank you. The uh, Correctional Association is an independent, not-for-profit organization that was founded in 1844 and is very unique in that it is charged with a mandate that we received from the New York State Legislature in 1846 that gives us access to all of the prisons in New York State and we monitor the conditions in those prisons and recommend our um, report our findings rather and then make, a rec make recommendations to the public and our elected officials. Um, at 169 years old, we have brought about a number of reforms in the prison system and the criminal justice system throughout New York State and we've been a major player on the national scene also. Great, thank you. Would you like to make a statement? We, we had talked about you sort of opening the program Cer certainly. Kicking the ball in the air. You use a terrible sports metaphor. Okay, I'll <laughs> kick the ball up in the air. Um, first of all, I want to say thank you to the organizers of this event for inviting me to participate. I consider it to be quite an honor. Um, some of what I'm going to say will probably best be characterized as not for the faint of heart, but I assume that if you came to this particular um, presentation, you weren't um, faint of heart. So let's talk about 1863 and what happened in this country, which is when the Emancipation Proclamation was um, announced by President Abraham Lincoln. Prior to that, the condition of, of primarily black people in the United States, the majority of whom were enslaved, did not find themselves brought before a court of law if they were accused of violating any of the, the rules and laws of, of the country. Their, their fate was determined primarily by their slave owner or some a mob of locals who would decide they were either going to beat them, maim them, kill them, and or sell off some of their family members. So the laws basically did not apply to um, black people uh, at that time. And so you didn't find large numbers of black people incarcerated in the, in the United States. But what happened after 1863 is that you had a large migration of recently freed um, black people moving to the north looking for opportunities, looking for education, looking for jobs, and for a, a new life. And this caused a major um, upset in the North, primarily amongst whites, being concerned that jobs were going to be taken and that their way of life was going to be upset. And the solution, quote unquote, to that was to start to criminalize African Americans throughout the country. That move was assisted by various social scientists and statisticians. 
Two in particular, a gentleman by the name of Nathan Shaler, who was Harvard educated, and a statistician named Frederick Hoffman, um, they came together and they used the census material that was um, published in 1890, which was the first time that you had a significant um, body of statistics that showed the percentage of people of African descent who were incarcerated in this country. And what we found in 1890 was that the African American population in this country was about 12 percent, almost exactly what it is today. The prison population of African Americans was about 30 percent. Now if you fast forward today, the prison population for African Americans ranges anywhere from 60 percent to as high as 80 percent, depending upon the state in which you are looking at the figures. But back in the 1890s, and their work helped to fuel um, a mindset criminalizing African Americans. So we were taking it now away from the um, enslavement of African Americans to the criminaliza criminalization and the marginalization of African Americans, thereby um, being used to challenge Reconstruction. For those of you who don't know, Reconstruction was a period in time where African Americans then had some political power. Another situation, particularly in the South, where they had not had political power before, and the powers that be, the, the white Southern power structure that had existed, was looking for ways to dismantle this growing body of political power that was being amassed by recently freed African Americans. And so Jim Crow laws were um, passed throughout the country that criminalized a whole host of behaviors and activities by um, recently freed slaves. So we had vagrancy laws, you couldn't spit on the sidewalk, you couldn't walk on the sidewalk, it was criminal to engage in interracial sexual um, relationships, and a whole host of other laws that were used to criminalize black people. Somewhat similar to what we found much more recently, driving while black or stop and frisk practices um, that are um, defended by our local police department and other elected officials. But I digress. So we go, we look at what was happening in the 1890s, and you have a number of African American scholars, including W.E.B. Du Bois and Ida B. Wells, who committed their careers to challenging the lynchings that were happening, because the work of Shaler and Hoffman was used to also fuel a, a justification in whites that they had the right to determine and, and um, basically bring to justice blacks who they felt had violated the laws and skipping past going to court and, and formal prosecutions. And so in the 1890s and early 1900s, there were thousands of lynchings throughout the United States of African Americans, in particular African American men, but also African American women. And then there, we went, moved from the um, public lynchings to what started to become known as the lynchings in the courtroom. And perhaps one of the most famous was the case of the Scottsboro boys in um, 1931. These young men, and they, you know, I use the term young men really euphemistically because they were children. They were 14 to 16 years old, and they were riding on a, uh, a car, boxcar train in Scottsboro, Alabama. And the authorities pulled them and a number of other people off the train because they were you know, on the train without having paid for their fare. And two young white um, girls who were on the train said that these young men had raped them. Though obviously there was no um, medical evidence to support that. Nonetheless, these young men were rushed to trial and found, excuse me, saying young men again, these boys were rushed to trial and found guilty, all but one of the 13-year-olds found guilty of rape and sentenced to 75 years to death. They um, won their case on appeal and then a second trial was held and at the second trial one of the two victims, one of the two accusers, recanted her testimony and yet still in that second trial these young boys were convicted again and the sentences were reinstated. And It was only when a third trial was um, held that some of them were acquitted, but to, 
Some were still convicted and sentenced, sentenced to prison and were incarcerated for a number of years. And it was only many years later that they, it was finally determined that none of them, in fact, were guilty. And only posthumously were, they, um, were their names cleared. But moving forward, so now that's what was happening in the early uh, 1930s. But then we still had a number of lynchings that were going on, even at the same time the blacks were being brought into court. They weren't getting fair trials, but they were still being brought into court. And then we had the horrific um, murder of Emmett Till in 1955, actually just Two months after I was born, Emmett Till, a young 14-year-old boy, was down south for the summer visiting, and he um, committed the, the heinous crime of whistling at a white woman. And for that crime, he was beaten, maimed, and murdered. And um, those who um, had done this to him were not prosecuted at the time, and his mother insisted that his coffin be kept open so that all of America and all of the world could see what had been done to him. But nonetheless, blacks were still getting the short end of the stick in the, um, in the court system. In the 1960s and 70s, then, we had the mushrooming of the civil rights movement. And many, many well-meaning people from the, the North went down to the South, blacks and whites alike, to try to bring about changes um, to ensure the right to vote for, for African Americans to ensure that people were able to vote for the people that they wanted and to have fair representation. There were maimings, beatings, and attacks of civil rights workers both from the South and from the North and of, of all races. And what else we saw at that same time was a huge mushrooming in the numbers of people who were being brought before the court system. And political dissent was being equated with criminalization and criminality. And so you saw many, many civil, work, civil rights workers, probably the most famous of whom was Martin Luther King, incarcerated, but many, many others. And at the same time that you had civil rights workers, being incarcerated, you had a number of members of national liberation movements here in this country also being criminalized. Perhaps the most well-known are members of the Black Panther Party, but there were many other groups, members of the Puerto Rican Independence Movement, the Native American Independence Movement, and very various um, progressive um, anti-imperialist white groups were also being prosecuted and filling the um, prison cells. So our rate of incarceration began to significantly grow in the 1960s and 70s. Before I go any further, is someone who's going to give me a time sign, or is that you, Jackson? I, I, I will. You'll I will give, me give me the high sign? Yes. OK, so let me keep going. I'm not, not too much more. Well, the historical elements that you're presenting are really important, so okay. please. Because it helps us explain how we got to where we That's are right. today. Right. So we have the criminalization of, of political dissent. And before I go any further, I want to make it particularly clear, because as the numbers have increased, and we see now that instead of um, blacks making up about 30% of the prison population, that they make up about 60 to 80% of the prison population, that's not because black folks or Latino folks or poor people commit any more crimes. And if the war on drugs has taught us nothing else, it has taught us that. Whites and blacks and Latinos and every other race use, possess, and sell drugs at approximately the same rate but the rate at which they are prosecuted is significantly different. And if you doubt that, and you doubt how the, the, the distinction in prosecution is being looked at, look at the crack powder cocaine distinction. Our um, in, well-informed elected officials in Congress made the um, courageous step, and I say that tongue in cheek, of changing the disparity from one in 100 to one in 18. So what does that tell us? It's still legal to racially discriminate based on one to 18. And they've said, you know, we've done a great thing. We've made a big difference. So the war on drugs is instructive, perhaps for nothing more than that, and how it has um, just blown out the prison cells with how many people are being prosecuted. 
And Might you just jail. say a word about how the war of drugs began, or, or what? And can you connect that certainly. to where you are in the history? Yeah, certainly. The war, first of all, the war on drugs didn't start with Richard Nixon when he declared a war on drugs, but it was convenient for Richard Nixon because he had also been informed that, and he could use an analysis and create again, which we were famous for in America, create the boogeyman that we had a lot of young whites who were using drugs. This was through, during the 60s and 70s, which was some called the Enlightenment period. Some people say it's just a period of being high. But <laughs> so you had that. But there was also this boogeyman of black folks who were high, black men who were high, black men on crack who were robbing people. So you had a, a real media push to say, if you wanted to be safe, you had to protect yourself from all of these high black folks who were running around robbing, maiming, killing. So it's um, a tactic of fear, basically, that's being introduced absolutely. to this conversation. It, it's, it, it's existed before. I mean, it's, it's not it's, really new, but it's correct. suddenly being reinvented with war on drugs. Right. And in America, yeah. you know, we declare war on everything. We have war on poverty, we fail. We have war on drugs, we fail. We have war on people, we fail. War on terror. War, war on terror, we really failed on that. Mm -hmm. but. But I, I, I want to try to, to wrap up this, this thing, and I'm glad you brought that up, um, Jackson, this thing of fear, because it, we still see that today. In fact, um, your, your um, police chief, I find that so hard to say, your police chief has just tried to justify stop and frisk by saying, actually, he's not stopping and frisk as many African Americans as he ought to, because actually more African Americans are engaged in crime than they are actually stopping. So we ought to be thankful to him. I haven't gotten around to giving him that thank you card. But can you say um, whose name, who that is? Ray Kelly. Thank you. Okay, Ray Kelly. I'm not not afraid to say it. Um, but you know. And this is the last point that I'm going to make, Jackson, and I'm, I'm sure others want, are going to be um, responding to this. Um, America has this very unhealthy appetite for criminalizing, beating, killing, maiming, and locking up black people, particularly black men. And I'm sure some of you are probably saying, well, that's, that's pretty harsh, that's pretty out there. Like, you know, what is Elijah talking about? Maybe she needs a vacation. That part's true. But <laughs> let me back up my my comment to you. And I'm going to read some names to you and see if you see any common thread amongst them, OK? So let's start with Rodney King. How many people remember him? OK, good, good. We're, I'm not going to ask you to raise your hands now. But so Rodney King, Oscar Grant, Romley Gray, Trayvon Martin, remember him? And Amadou Diallo and Abner Louima. And then there's Michael Vick and Muhammad Ali and Mary J. Blige and James Brown and Wesley Snipes and Angela Davis, Little Kim, Lauren Hill, Tupac Shakur, and O.J. Simpson, and Asada Shakur, who was just put on the terrorist list. Now, I don't care what you think about Asada Shakur, but she was arrested, charged, and convicted for the shooting on a New Jersey turnpike of one trooper. Have anybody, has anybody said that the folks in Columbine or the young man in Newton, Connecticut was a terrorist? Or how about Posada, who's living in Miami, who's admitted to planting bombs in Havana and killing people and being engaged in terrorist activity for years and years, who enjoys comfort in Miami? But anyway, again, I digress. And last but not least, we talk about the Central Park Five. A group of young men aged 14 to 16 years old who were charged with raping a white woman jogging in Central Park. They were labeled as a wolf pack. They were demonized, terrorized. Their families were degraded and destroyed. And these young men were locked up in New York State prisons for years and years. And when did that happen? Well, that was 1989. It almost seems a lifetime ago, but not for those young men and not for their families. And then we fast forward. Finally, the truth came out. A man who was doing time upstate New York came forward and admitted that he was the person that committed that rape. And what did our Manhattan District Attorney's Office do and our police department? They held strong. And they refused to bend for years. They refused to admit that they had gone after the wrong people. Finally, a judge 
decided to throw out the convictions of these young men. And in 2003, they filed a lawsuit against New York City, as rightfully they should have. And this Manhattan District Attorney's Office continued to hold firm and say they would not bend. They would not settle that lawsuit. They would not admit to what they had done to these young men. Similar in the way that the Scottsboro Boys had been gone after some 54 years earlier. And here we are today, some 10 years after that lawsuit was filed on behalf of the Central Park Five, and this city still has not agreed to settle that case, admit to their wrongdoing, and say enough is enough. We're going to stop criminalizing people based on the color of their skin. So for those who doubt whether or not we have racist tradition frozen in our criminal justice system and our prison system, you need not look any further than the case of the Central Park Five to convict those who are in charge of this system. And that built, of course, upon the fear of wilding, which was a very popular phrase at that time. Right. And one more thing before I turn the conversation over to our other panelists, can you make a statement about the association between poverty, race, drugs, and how those words are linked, and or the, those, those, what's the root? Certainly. Well, you know, the media and um, some elected officials who try to manipulate what the reality is will say that, um, first of all, we know, what we know is a disproportionate number of poor people are incarcerated. It's certainly not true that a disproportionate number of poor, poor people engage in drug use. Not by, in fact, the more money you have, the more access you have, the more um, variety you have. I'm not going to ask the people to raise their hands to agree with me, OK? But is, if there's anybody who disagrees with me, we'll talk afterwards, OK? So the connection, but um, uh, it's been popularized, and um, the need to appear to be tough on crime, the need to appear to be um, protecting society, pub the public safety, what I call smoke and mirrors, is, has been associated with going after drugs and, uh, and linking it to race and poverty. There is no accurate linkage between those things. In, in similar ways that Shaler and, and Hoffman distorted what reality was, we have a number of social scientists and elected officials who do the same thing today. And that evidence is, is emerging more and more clearly with all the, uh, with the latest statistics, which we'll, we'll, we'll talk about Absolutely. in a moment. May I turn to you, Mark, and ask you to speak? And Mark Maurer is the executive director of the Sentencing Project. Maybe a sentence or two about the sentence? The Sentencing Project, we're, we're not quite as old as the Correctional Association, uh, but it was founded 26 years ago. We're based in Washington, D.C., and we're engaged in research, public education advocacy around criminal justice policy, essentially trying to challenge mass incarceration, the racial dynamics behind that, and talk about other approaches to public safety. And maybe would you like to build upon some of the, uh, mm -hmm. the ideas that Sophia has presented to us today? Sure. Well, um, let me just begin with a quick story and then a, a few comments. Uh, Story concerns a friend of mine. Uh, my friend and his wife are parents to three teenage kids, two girls and a boy. Their son, uh, being a good teenage boy, started to do teenage boy things. So he was staying out late at night, he was smashing up the family car every now and then. There may have been some drinking and drug use going on. His grades were slipping at school. So his parents were concerned. It was nothing terrible, but they were concerned. And one night they get a call from the police uh, to say, could they come and pick up their son at the police station? He'd just been arrested for shoplifting at the local 7-Eleven. So they go down and pick up their son. And over the course of the next two weeks, are engaged in discussions with the police and then the prosecutor assigned to the case about how to deal with the problem. And essentially, they said to the, uh, the prosecutor, uh, you know, our son's been having problems. We know he's having problems. He knows he's having problems. Uh, we found a social worker we think can help him. Uh, he's amenable to working with the social worker. We think we can work that through. And the prosecutor basically said, uh, you know, that sounds like a good plan to me. It's the first time he's been arrested. It was only a shoplifting charge, so let's drop the charges and you go and do that. 
So they take off. Uh, the son works with the social work, indeed. It does help him, and he starts doing better in school, and he starts figuring out what he wants to do, and then going off to college and looking like he's going to have you know, a nice, good middle-class career, whatever he chooses to do. So the same night my friend's son was arrested, I would imagine not very far away, there was another young man, teenager arrested too for the same crime, uh, whose parents may not have had the resources, financial or the negotiating skills to deal with the prosecutor around these things. Now you're not gonna go to prison on your first shoplifting charge. You know, you'll pay a fine or do some community service work or so, but uh, you're gonna get a conviction and then six months later, maybe he's breaking into a car or another theft or something and all of a sudden he starts to look like one of these habitual offenders that we hear about and we have policies for imposing more prison time on them. So we have the same kinds of behavior. We tend to think of the criminal justice system as the way that we respond to these behaviors, but in fact, we have a variety of ways of dealing with these issues depending on the individual and community resources that each of us brings to the problem and how we as a community decide to define the problem. So we've come in the last 40 years when we've had this prison explosion to think that the criminal justice problem is our primary approach to public safety. In fact, that has become the primary approach in low-income communities of color, essentially. We've made a very significant shift. It's been a very conscious policy shift uh, when there are generally speaking, a broad range of ways to deal with public safety, one of which is criminal justice, but only one of which. And so what we've done is to sort of institutionalize a very different approach uh, with, I think, by all accounts, you know, very disastrous results in terms of the ability of those communities to deal with public safety problems uh, in a more constructive way and what it's doing to us as a society as well. I'm gonna just for a moment tell a personal anecdote. I was arrested um, about three years ago and it involved an altercation. I was riding my bicycle home and I was pinned by a car on purpose, a, a big SUV, and I was not allowed to move and the light kept changing and I was still being held there and I was beside a moving van. And I eventually saw that, he, that I could get by if I could move the mirror I moved the mirror, it bounced out. I moved the mirror, it bounced out. And by this time, I was really sort of panicked, and we had had an exchange of words. I pushed the mirror really hard, and it broke. And I feel no remorse or regret about that at all. I got past him. I went up on the sidewalk with my bike, and I know this is my neighborhood, this is my precinct, and I know the cops hang out at this restaurant, a French restaurant, there's a bench there, and I'm looking for them, and I know I'm on that block. And I get thrown to the ground with such force that both of my shoes come off, every you know, bag, every computer flying down the street. And I'm arrested. And by a policeman who hasn't identified himself, no. And I'm thinking, wow, I'm white in my own neighborhood. And this America is changing. <laughs> but eventually, I'm put in the police van, and they don't take my cell phone. And I'm alone in there, and I'm scrolling through my phone, and I'm, my hands are handcuffed behind me, and I'm going through my phone and saying, now who, this is a really important call, who is the person to call? Bob Carey, president of the New School. You're supposed to call me, Jackson. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't have your number then. <laughs> but I called Bob Carey, president of the New School. I get his wife. I said, I don't know if you can hear me, but I'm being arrested. I'm being taken to the 10th precinct. I need your help, blah, blah, blah. I get to the precinct, and I'm slammed around like everybody else, and then, all of a sudden the conversation changes and it becomes Mr. Taylor, would you like your things, blah, blah, blah. And you know, you may keep your phone, would you like water? And there's a guy lying on the floor with his head split open. And I said, you know, no, maybe he'd like some. And I'm not, I'm not heroic in this, I'm, you know, your heart's pounding. But they called the general counsel of the university where I was working, they called Pearl Street, and then they called the precinct, and then they go, oh my God, college professor, blah, 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 blah. It changed and he's white. And I, but I also knew 10 years ago, I didn't think I would probably be arrested in the way that I was arrested and thrown to the street without, I thought it was the person from the car doing it. I didn't even realize it was a cop. Anyway, that's a personal anecdote, but I wanted to illustrate in my own life how I think our lives have all changed. And um, 
it's sad every way you look at it. Um, I'd like to introduce uh, Laura Kurgan. And Laura has this incredible new book, which I want you to just take a couple minutes and describe. And um, the, the opening chapter is particularly apropos to this festival because it is about the world. And the last chapter in the book is about prison. And this is about evidence for the things that we're saying, a further kind of evidence. Well, thanks. Uh, can everybody hear me? Yeah. Um, the book is the book is outside, and and uh, as um, Jackson was saying, the last chapter is about incarceration. But the the book is about the uses of um, global positioning system. Everyone knows what that is, right? Um, satellite imagery and what's called geographic information systems. And I've been following and tracking these technologies since the early 90s in a way um, of trying to understand um, how we see the world differently, really. That's, I think, the, the bottom line of the, of the book. But the, this incarceration project, actually, I started um, uh, with, with Susan and with someone named um, Eric Kadora. Um, and Susan actually put us put us together through um, a granting opportunity um, to to make maps of what Sophia is talking about, what Mark is talking about, um, and it's it's a project that I started in the year 2005, and um, they're going to force me to try get online here, um, and. And, continu and continues. It's kind of a project you can't, you can't let go of. So what's unique about me is that I'm not a criminal justice activist. I've never been arrested. Um, I, uh, there's still time. There's still time. <laughs> there's still time. Give it another um, and, 10 years. <laughs> yeah, and I'm, I'm an architect. Um, but what the project that I was working about taught me that is that this is not a, a project um, about criminal justice. This is a project about the city, and it's a, a project about every city um, across the United States. Um, and I can, you know, I can show you why, right? So the, the project is called, uh, started as an exhibition called Architecture and Justice. It was a collaboration with Eric Kadora, who received this kind of um, data from the prison system, from the court system. As somebody leaves court, um, they are sentenced, uh, finally, to prison. And um, the records tell you their crime, their name, um, and their home address. So what we started to do was to map the home address of people instead of the crime that they committed. Crime, uh, crime maps, as you know, are rampant um, around the city. So, but once you have the home address of someone, it can be drawn as a point on a map with geographic information software. And you can then um, coordinate that geography um, with a larger geography called a census block, which is where people live. Um, and if you look now, the bright red uh, spots on the map are places in Brooklyn which have the highest incidence of incarceration. Right? So as everybody is saying, this is just a picture to show it, that data in geographic context shows people are highly concentrated in specific neighborhoods. And when you add it up, you know, it costs around $30,000 to incarcerate someone nowadays. It's probably gone up. That 55 in New York now? Okay. $55,000 in, in New year. York. Okay. Well, then this map would be different today. But in, in that year, it cost $359 million to incarcerate people um, from Brooklyn over the course of their sentence. Right, so um, what we tried to do was to link the home address of these poor neighborhoods, uh, poor neighborhoods of color in, in Brooklyn, New York, to where they are incarcerated upstate New York. Um, and then uh, we focused um, through various methods, which I don't have time to go into now, on community district 16 in Brooklyn, which is Brownsville, Brownsville, Brooklyn, which as you know has does have one of the highest incidences of crime, but also the highest incidences of poverty. Um, and we found that 3.5% of that population lives in New York, while 8.5, it, it houses 8.5% of its prison population. So that's the kind of concentration that we look for. Um, you know, these are the blocks, these are the people that live there. Mm -hmm. This is how much it costs over the course of their incarceration. Um, and so that's what we call million dollar blocks. So those 11 blocks, it cost $11 million to incarcerate those people. 
So um, the question we ask is, you know, what does it mean that a governing institution, that that's the predominant governing institution in that poor neighborhood, um, that the prisoners come home um, three years after they're incarcerated? On average. On average. <laughs> Um, because of recidivism, and the question we asked is, you know, what would the city l look like if it wasn't this way, if the city, you know, wasn't spending so much money on displacement, but might be able to spend money in other ways in these, in these neighborhoods. Um, so I can either stop there or go No, on. keep going, keep going. Keep going? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> well, then I'm going to jump forward, okay, to um, a project that I, that I did with, uh, with Susan in, um, in 2010, and I'll just read this to you. This is another one who should be added And I'm going to just, before you go on yeah. to that next, okay. I just want to say one of the points of this panel, we wanted to frame a critique, we wanted to frame an analysis, and we asked Sophia to also include the historical perspective so that we could get to where we are now. And now we're also interested in moving the conversation into saying, well, what can we do? How do we do it? How do I address my own white privilege? And then those of you who are white, how do you address your own white privilege um, to solve these problems as a group? And also put our imaginations to work in a forward thinking way to conceive of a world that isn't the world we're in now but a world that we'd like to be in. And I think where we're going in this conversation is a piece of that. Yeah, okay. So, um, so this is, jump, jump, you jump. jump to probation. Yeah, to probation. Maybe we should talk Do you want a little to more about the justice Yeah, why don't you, do yeah, you why don't you no, introduce please, that? Please. Yeah, no. okay. No, please, yeah. by all okay. means. Um, I mean, we all work together. There's no wrong way to do yeah, this. Yeah, we all work together. <laughs> yeah, so, uh, it's a network. Um, so my name is Susan Tucker. Yeah. Um, I'm currently, for the last three years, can you, okay. Uh, for the last three years, I've been working um, at the New York City Department of Probation, which I can get to in a minute. Uh, and for the previous 11 years, maybe, um, I was directing something called the After Prison Initiative at the Open Society Foundations, which is the Soros Foundation. And when we started that, um, we were thinking about, well, what happens to people after prison? And we were also thinking, what happens after we stop thinking of prison as the option of first resort? And we were very uh, concerned about the numbers. Uh, in fact, when I started out as a criminal defense lawyer in 1972, um, we had 200,000 people incarcerated in America. And now we have um, two and a half million which is astronomical. I'm not a numbers person. Mark can elaborate on this. But in addition to those two and a half million, we have another like seven or eight million uh, every day who are on probation or parole. And then of course, if you think over the years, how many people um, are walking around with prior criminal convictions who, I think as Sophia mentioned, uh, are never really free of that stigma. Uh, and it's not just a, um, a label, although the label is bad, but it also means that there are incredible barriers and obstacles to people getting employment. And frozen in time. Frozen mm -hmm. in time and getting um, education, uh, getting to ba back together with their families, getting health care, et cetera. Um, so the, the numbers are striking. And when we formed the After Prison Initiative, it was sort of at a moment when people were also beginning to think about the enormous um, migration of people in and out of communities. So we have about 650,000 people a year who come home from prison. And I guess about that number who are being admitted to prison. And we were becoming increasingly aware of, well, what's happening to these people? You know, what do we do to keep them from going back? Especially for people who've been, you know, upstate, you know, for a long time. And have many, you know, young men particularly go to prison, young black men go to prison early you know, 18, 19, spend the next 10, 15, 20 years locked up during a period of their lives when normally they would be acquiring an education, getting work experience, getting a family, et cetera. So we were really concerned about that. Um, and at the same time, we were becoming aware, and this sort of gets, I think, to what Sophia was talking about, which is that uh, the criminalization um, of communities of color has an impact not just on individual people, individual men and women, but because of the astronomical numbers and the high concentration of people going in and out of prison in certain communities. I mean, it's not like 
it's not an equal opportunity employer. It's not across the board. And you know, if you live in whatever city you live in, you can probably imagine which neighborhoods uh, are, have the most people going in and out of prison. But at the same time, research was beginning to be done by Todd Clear and other people about, well, what is the effect itself of incarceration on these communities? And we began to see that incarceration itself is both an effect of um, racism, uh, economic inequality. Um, I often say now that um, we've criminalized you know, poor people, black people, the mentally ill, um, the people you know, addicted to substances of one kind or another, youth in general. I mean, when you see it here, I think when you hear youth and urban youth, that's a euphemism for young black boys. Um, and now immigrants, of course. And basically, you know, anybody who is sort of not making it, uh, this has become our way of, uh, incarceration's become our way of controlling, uh, you know, the rabble. Uh, the populations that are challenging and difficult uh, for the mainstream America. So, you know, I, th I think, um, I also think that what happened in the 70s, which you alluded to, was, is really, uh, was really a backlash against the, the successes of the civil rights movement and the anti-war movement and the anti-imperialism movement. And, you know, we're still living with that and we've become, unfortunately, very accustomed to it. So I could go on about that, but what I would like to mention in particular is that part of the analysis that grew out of looking at what was happening in these communities, we were thinking, well, what do we do about the effect of, incar of incarceration uh, itself on the neighborhoods where we're spending these millions of dollars a year in New York upstate? So we're basically employing upstate people, mostly white people, uh, to uh, oversee black people from downstate. And what's happening at the same time is that a huge disinvestment of public resources in the communities that people live in before and after prison. So we were starting to think about, well, what can we do to somehow um, uh, repair the harm? Uh, in fact, I and some other people were really thinking about it, although we didn't talk about it publicly this way, as you know, a reparations project. Because how do we, how do we uh, undo and try to reverse uh, the negative effects of mass incarceration on communities of color. So out of this came an idea of what we call justice reinvestment. Uh, and the idea being in shorthand, and I, the references that you can uh, read, if you just Google it, you'll get a lot of information. Uh, but the idea was, what if we had an initiative that uh, was aimed at downsizing prison populations and budgets significantly in order to really downsize, you can't just reduce the population by a few. You actually have to have enough fewer people going to prison and staying in prison that you can close a prison or you can close a wing of a prison because otherwise you're employing the same amount of people to watch fewer people. And it is a big employment issue, which we can talk about. Um, and so the idea, so part one of justice reinvestment was really about you know, uh, changing the policies because it was really, I think as, a lot of, as Sophia mentioned, it wasn't that people were creating more crimes, it's just that we were criminalizing different kinds of activity and a lot of that criminalizing was focused on certain people. So we thought, well, okay, if you could downsize the prisons, you could downsize the budgets, you would uh, generate savings either now or in the future. And then, so the second part was to capture some portion of that savings to be reinvested in the communities where people live, rather than just going into the black hole of the state budget, which of course is very tempting because there are a lot of demands on the state budget. But the idea was what we really wanted to do was um, strengthen the basic civil society institutions that have been depleted by investment in prison instead of in education, healthcare, job creation, mental health, community mental health treatment, et cetera. So out of this came this and initiative. Art. And, 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 and art. And art. And, and, every, and everything. And writing. And, everything. and culture. Yeah, right. I think it's important, actually. Right. Yeah. And the hope was, actually, yeah. that um, the part of the project would be, you know, analysis, you know, policy analysis on the state level, but really more importantly, that there would be um, organizing to create a demand from the communities that are affected, you know, saying, you know, we're disenfranchised economically, politically. I mean, obviously a lot of people who go in and out of prison have been 
literally disenfranchised from voting. And it not doesn't affect them, but it affects the whole community and their representation in Congress or in the State Assembly, et cetera. Um, and we need, we really need, uh, have needed and still don't have enough demand from educators and healthcare providers to say, hey, look, you know, we're funding the wrong things. You know, we should put, be putting in, California is a great example, because when many of us were growing up, everyone wanted to live in California because they had the best schools. You know, now they have almost, they have the most people in prison, or is yeah. Louisiana number one? Louisiana, Louisiana and then, Louisiana. I mean, we can debate about, you know, yeah. which is worse, but, um, so, th so that's the idea of justice reinvestment grew out of that. And it really was inspired by the kind of analysis that Eric Kadora and Laura Kurgan um, are doing, which really was inspired by uh, a formerly incarcerated person, a uh, friend of some of us, uh, Eddie Ellis, who was in prison uh, for 25 years in Attica and other places, who along with other um, colleagues in prison, who at that point were studying, because there were still a lot of college in prison at that point, and they started doing research. And Eddie's research suggested that most of the prison population in New York State came from seven neighborhoods in New York City. And that's more or less the case, whether it's seven, eight, ten, you know, we could talk about that. Uh, but I think it's very interesting to sort of see that history in the context. And, you know, and Eddie and some of the other people were political activists, which is why they were in prison. So, you know, it sort of comes full circle. But so now we're in a place where both nationally, and then later I can talk a little bit about what we're doing in New York City at the Department of Probation uh, around justice reinvestment. But I think that's sort of, you know, what we're trying to figure out is what's, what are some solutions uh, to this, uh, the American gulag, as Ruthie Gilmore says, that we're living in right now? How do we um, undo um, the great harm that's being done, I would say, to in individuals, these particular communities, but to all of us in terms of, uh, you know, the idea of a just, a legitimate justice system. Mark, getting back to your story about your friend's son and that comparison you're making, if uh, he, he was a young man of color in one of the neighborhoods marked on Laura's map, what would be the comparison of how he's classified in terms, you know, in contrast to the, you know? Well, um, you know, he's, you know, if, if you're charged with shoplifting, a, a lot of different things can happen. Uh, you know, they could say, give us back the candy bar, go home. They could say, you know, pay us for it. They could, uh, you know, you could, uh, it'd be some sort of infraction or so. Uh, but it also can't be prosecuted, you know, even as a felony if you take uh, an object out of the, the store. So uh, the criminal justice system is based on discretion in enormous ways. And, uh, you know, we have many friends and colleagues who are those people who use their discretion, whether it's police, prosecutors, judges, corrections officials, who, uh, who I would trust uh, to make, <coughs> make good decisions. But... There are many who we have very good documented evidence, you know, use their discretion, whether consciously or not, in ways, uh, you know, with very strong racist outcomes, unfair outcomes. And and we, so a social, um, it would be a social problem for a person of color or, or a personality problem, but a, a white person would be an infraction of a one-time event that probably happened, their parents show up with them to court or something and make a case that this won't happen again. We have a whole support network in place, but yeah. but not saying, oh, it's a social. Yeah, I mean, the one thing we know, I think, the every time you have contact with the justice system, it just makes it increasingly likely you're going to have more. And you know, that's the whole story behind you know, what's been called the school to prison pipeline. Essentially, you know, problems that used to be handled at the school level now increasingly refer to the juvenile justice system. And once you get into the juvenile justice system, it's almost a guaranteed admission to the adult prison system uh, just a few years down the road. And yet you're classified as having a social um, sociopathy or something, or, or there's not a support network around you you don't have the same thing. Let me just tell one quick story, not a story, a research finding. Uh, uh, some researchers did a, a study of probation officers. Uh, this was in a northwest state. The uh, juvenile probation officers, and basically they have to make recommendations to the judge 
uh, about, about sentencing of these juvenile offenders. So they, they look at various factors, the offense and the prior record, but they also have to write up a description of the kids, uh, their narrative about you know, their sense of who these kids are, potential for rehabilitation and the like. So the researchers compared the narratives that were written about these kids and they broke it down by race. And essentially what they found was the white kids were described as having environmental problems. You know, they were having problems at home, they were having problems at school, dealing with their teachers and all that, those kinds of things. The black kids were much more likely defined as having antisocial personalities and the like. Disorders. Disorders, yes. So what's the distinction here, the importance? Well, if you have environmental problems, there are things we could try to do. We could have counselors dealing with your family. We could have tutors helping you at school. There are things we could at least try, interventions that uh, presumably might work in some cases. If you have a bad personality, we can't give you a new personality. And so uh, you know, how we divide people, and you, know, that would, you would never see that in the courtroom, but in effect, you know, those conscious or unconscious assumptions play into it. And that's all the steps of taking you into the courtroom or all those decisions. Right. Sophia, let me ask you another question. Who benefits by this system that's in place now or has been in place? Everyone. There's certainly corporate interests that are making a ton of money on caging people. Every, everything that you use to um, run a prison, the hardware, the software, you know, the, the computerized um, data, the uniforms, the food products, the vending machines, the transportation vehicles, everyone who makes something, everyone who has a job making that stuff, everyone who has a job selling that stuff. I mean, there's, on, it, I always actually find it kind of funny. The, the name, the Correctional Association, is frequently misunderstood by um, those companies and corporations that make the profit off of running prisons. So they invite me to all these conferences. So one day I think I'll go as a mole. But, um, but so those, this obviously the money, corporate interest, but. And they there's also have advertising officials. budgets. They oh, they certainly yeah. advertising yeah. budgets. Yeah. But there's elected officials who make money off of this too because they, they keep selling to people that they have to be safe. And so if you, uh, in that marketing of that ugly four letter word that begins with F that you mentioned earlier that was fear, I don't was let anybody say get nervous. I circle back to right. fear again. Is, um, is the thing that we keep using to drive this. And so when you say who benefits off of it, anybody who thinks that they're safer because this system is in place, benefits. And who of it. feels more afraid watching television or not watching television? I personally always find myself coming away from television feeling afraid, and I think there's a whole, a whole mechanism of entertainment designed to keep us afraid. Uh, oh, absolutely. I mean, it's it's driven by that. I, I mean, I personally um, buried the television a long time ago, and I don't watch anybody else's. Um, when I go to the gym, I close my eyes because I can't stand it. But um, the media is constructed to keep um, marketing fear to us. Um, you know, there's not a time that you can turn on the television. If you dare to watch the news, even if you're not watching the news, all of a sudden you'll get something that says breaking news. And I can assure you, breaking news is going to include a dark face. If you remember, the first reports about what happened in Boston with the marathon bombing, the suspect was a black man. Well, I mean, you can think a lot of things about the person that was ultimately arrested, but I don't think anybody would mistake him as a black man. But that's the first thing that was put out. It was so consistent with that fear and that criminalization. The suspect, the perpetrator, always has dark skin. Well, and the eyes that are glued to the set for that kind of fear installment are not glued to the street, not glued to the porch, not glued to the neighbors. It's, it's such isolation. Of course fear is bred from that. Can I say one other thing? Please. Yeah. You know, I, um, my office is on 125th Street and Adam Clayton Powell Boulevard. We are in the epicenter of Harlem. I love it, okay? And that also gives me the opportunity to see 16 surveillance cameras at that intersection, okay? And about an equal number of cops all day long, okay? And I live on Eastern Parkway across the street from the Brooklyn Museum. I can count the times in a day that I see a cop. Or if I stay on the Upper West Side, I have to go search to find a cop, find a precinct, okay? So the over-policing 
of communities of color, particularly poor communities of color, is mind-boggling, absolutely mind-boggling. You could, quite frankly, if you really wanted to engage in crime, all you have to do is make sure that you don't do it on 125th Street, okay? <laughs> thank you, thank you. Laura, you wanna move into talking about the probation, probation project? project? Yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, so I like to talk with slides. <laughs> um, so so the, the, when we fast forwarded um, this project, um, we made maps um, while Susan was working at the Department of Probation with data which basically reinforced the, the maps that I had drawn before. Um, so it's the same people, the same neighborhoods that are high incarceration have high numbers of people on probation. Um, and actually we focused on the same community district again in Brownsville. Um, so this is you know, where people live. They probably, if they're on probation, and if you don't know, probation is an alternative. I didn't know that when I started the project. An alternative to incarceration. You have not been, you get sentenced to probation, um, and you, you know, for that reason, you do not get sent to prison, and you effectively get some kind of a second chance. But, so people who are on probation constantly have to go from where they live to places that look like this. Um, so I'll just quickly read you, um, in, this is from a, a quote from Jay-Z's book. In places like the Marcy, there are people who know the ins and outs of government bureaucracies, police procedures, and sentencing guidelines, who spend half of their lives in dirty waiting rooms on plastic chairs waiting for someone to call their name. But for all this involvement, the government might as well be the weather, because a lot of us don't think we have anything to do with it. We don't believe we have any control over this thing that controls us. Um, so we went and looked at a, at a number um, of these probation waiting rooms and I got put on something called the waiting room improvement team. Um, <laughs> but the idea of which was to have a participatory workshop with probation officers, with people on probation, um, and with all kinds of other uh, stakeholders in, in the city. Um, and you know the the job was you know fix the waiting room, um, and you know and it was supposed to be you know probation officers go off and buy new couches and paint the rooms and it was myself and someone named Craig Hosang who worked in the um, mayor's office of operations who realized there was much more going on in these rooms than met the eye, um, and we both went home from the first waiting room improvement team uh, meeting and sent proposals back to the commissioner of probation and said, you know, we really don't think this is a job that can be uh, fixed with new couches and color on the walls and things like that. So we undertook a, um, a, 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 um, a more controlled <laughs> workshop with, with uh, various people and tried to, uh, tried to introduce them to something that's called, you know, I would call integrated design, where you understand that things are not only about the physical space, including a place like Brownsville, Brooklyn, you know, but it's about the um, processes that are in place in the whole Department of Probation, the resources that are available, um, what a person experiences as they come in the door, have to take off their belt, go through a security, you know, through the, basically they go to probation in a, court, in a courtroom setting. Um, and without going into a lot of detail about this, we came up with a kit of parts that addressed not only the space of the room, but how um, people are treated in that room, what probation officers call themselves, how they talk to their clients, almost like, you know, you call up 311 and you say, I have a problem. They say, hello, may I help you? There's a script and there's, this, this happens um, in all kinds of um, places in the city. But most um, importantly, what we realize is that these are, there's 15 uh, probation rooms in the whole of New York City. So these are spaces are anywhere from 200 square feet to 1,000 square feet. And if you added that up to the renovation of 15 rooms, um, you would be, you know, and the processes that go through this room, you would actually be changing uh, urban infrastructure. And so the, on the day that the, that the um, report was approved by the commissioner, he did this video conference. And so this is us presenting to all the uh, other waiting rooms um, in the city. 
And so here's an example of a before and after. In, uh, this is at 60 Center Street in New York City. Um, and this is in the Bronx. Um, which, is a, which is another one of these places. But the project has gone further, and Susan should probably um, uh, talk about this to something called NEONs, which are Neighborhood Economity, Economic Opportunity Networks, which rather than having people go all the way from where they live, uh, miss their classes, you know, because it takes so long to sit in a probation office, to have probation located in the neighborhood they live in. And that's been a big I'm really glad. I just want to say, so, so to my mind as an administrator too, like it, I always, under, I never understood it takes just as much effort to buy really ugly furnishings as it does. It's oh, like so much easier. Right? It's so much <laughs> easier it's, to buy ugly furniture. Th is it, you, you think? Imagine. I don't know. I think it takes the same. But it's tied to well, what you think of the people who are exactly. going to be using it. Yeah. So I mean, I guess what, I mean, in, in a way, this is all actually a long kind of interesting story, but um, we have um, Vinnie Chiraldi, Vincent Chiraldi became the commissioner of probation in February of 2010, and I started working with him in March. And, you know, there was data about, well, first of all, we supervised 25,000 people. I was just saying this to somebody from New Orleans, and he was like overwhelmed. I mean, that's a lot of people, 25,000 people on probation. Uh, and when Laura said before, people often don't understand the difference between probation and parole, because parole is community supervision after you've been in prison. It extends the time that you're under the control of the state. Probation is in lieu of prison unless you screw up, in which case you can get set to prison or jail. Um, so on the one hand, one, from, a, from a totally data point of view, one of the things that we found was that um, even though uh, at that point about half of the people who were reporting um, to probation were not actually seeing a probation officer, which was a good thing. They were just reporting to a kiosk, you know, once a month, putting their hand in and answering a few questions. If they don't get into trouble, we leave them alone. Uh, and this was instituted under a prior commissioner because we realized there are a lot of people on probation, kind of like Mark's story. If you heard what some of the people are on probation for, you would be mortified you know, turnstile jumping, you know, really minor stuff. Now, we also in New York have some people who are convicted of very serious crimes on probation, which I also think is a good thing. But, um, so about half of the people at that point were reporting to a kiosk. The other half are seeing a probation officer, usually once a week or twice a month, depending on a variety of things. And basically, they come to rooms like you saw there, and they wait sometimes for a long time, many, many hours, and doing nothing, like there was nothing there for them to do. And as the commissioner said, these rooms kind of screamed, we hate you, we think you're you know, a low life, it's not really, we're not gonna be bothered. And they had signs all over that said, you know, take off your hat, don't eat, don't sleep, don't drink, don't talk on your phone, don't talk to your neighbor. I mean, it was like, no, 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 no. And because we were coming uh, to this, uh, to the Department of Probation with the idea of A, doing a justice reinvestment initiative, and from a more asset versus deficit um, model, and also most of the people he hired were um, reform advocates who were concerned about mass incarceration, and not just mass incarceration, but the huge numbers of people who were on probation and parole for a long time. If you're convicted of a felony in New York, uh, you get at least five years probation, uh, and some people up to 10 years, and if you're convicted of a sex crime, it can be even longer, right? And this is despite the fact that the research shows that after about 18 months, it's diminishing returns. I mean, it interrupts your life in a lot of different ways, and we also know from the research that many, if not most, government touches are not good, are harmful, particularly for people who have been convicted of low-level crimes. So part of our objective has been to minimize um, the number of people who actually have to see a probation officer on a regular basis. And now we're even going to voice recognition, which is great, so people don't have to interrupt their lives to report in. Um, but I was teaching, um, we had a post-release program at Penn, and we were teaching writing classes to men and women who had just gotten out thinking if we could give them some level of, of skill with language right. that it would help them. Yeah. you know, against recidivism in that first year. And 
over and over again. Somebody would weep or cry because they, had, they were motivated, they wanted to come learn, they were getting something from the class and they would have to go to a probation hearing, parole hearing, and they'd have to miss class and they would, they would say, I can't be here all day. And right. you knew it was true because you knew where they were going. Right, so part of what we were noticing was that these spaces were not conducive to the reforms that we wanted to make. We wanted an asset-based model. We wanted people not to be wasting their time when they came. We wanted it to be productive. Plus, we didn't want people to have to travel so far and wait so long for a 10 or 15 minute session with their PO, which is what led to what we call the Neighborhood Opportunity Network. We've abbreviated it NEON, N-E capital O-N. Um, and the idea was to decentralize probation, move it to the communities where people live, and now we have uh, five neons, uh, Brownsville, Central Harlem, the South Bronx, Jamaica, and Staten Island. We have what are called neon satellites in neighborhoods that have fewer people on probation, one in East Harlem, West Harlem, three in Staten Island, and we're about to open one in Bed-Stuy and one in um, East New York. So we're in the process of neonizing the agency so the idea being that, A, people can get to probation more quickly. The offices are smaller. Small is good. Uh, you get known. Uh, people are less inclined. The staff is less inclined to let you wait a long time. Plus, the idea is that the NEON is really supposed to be a really different way of doing the business of probation. It's really about networks, uh, getting our staff connected with other people in the community, other institutions that are doing you know, healthcare, education, drug treatment, whatever, uh, connecting our clients to those networks because the whole idea is about expanding opportunity, particularly around education, jobs, and community engagement. Second, uh, working with people in their communities in a different way, having a different connection to them. And third, really getting more engaged with the community because part of the idea is you really, like, you know, they say it takes a village to raise a kid. Our idea is that really people are back in their neighborhoods, everybody, their families, their networks, the businesses, everybody should be involved in trying to make sure that they're successful and that we don't want them connected to the Department of Probation. We don't want them to have a transference to their PO. We want them to have connections to other people in the community um, who can do interesting things with them because a lot of people who are in the system, whether they're on probation or parole or in prison, are people who have been basically shunted to not great institutions, schools, et cetera. Uh, and their opportunities have been really limited. So, you know, we're trying to A, get out of the way, uh, and B, to the extent that we need to be involved or we're mandated to be in involved by the government, uh, let's make the waiting rooms a more positive place. Let's try to get our probation staff uh, to have a more uh, positive, uh, productive interaction with the client so that it's not about watch them and catch them, which is really sort of what the ethos had been. But let's see if we can try to look at people as individuals and figure out, you know, like you've got all these things in your life together, but you've got this one thing you're working on, how can we help you, you know, deal with that? You need to get to school, you need to graduate, you need to get a GED, how can we help you do that? So all of this is kind of, I would say, you know, an integrated justice reinvestment model in the sense that we're uh, investing our resources our staff and other resources, you know, in the communities where our clients live. Even, uh, I, Laura was really instrumental on this because a big part of the waiting room improvement team actually was an exercise that she did early on asking the probation staff to describe the clients. Because she said, well, you know, I don't really know anything about probation. I don't know who the people are that you're working with. Tell me about them. And basically the response was, well, you know, Jose, uh, you know, is 18. He was busted on the corner of 125th and, uh, Martin Luther King, uh, and he was busted for X, and he got a five-year sentence, and that was it. And Lord said, well, you know, well, what else do you know about it? Does he like jazz? Does he play basketball? Does he support his family? Does he like to travel? You know, to try to say, well, who, who are the people that we're working with? And because if we just think of them as labels. Well, that's also breaking down the whole language around the well, industry. Well, that's what I was about of, to get yeah, to. Inmates, prisoners, well, right, as opposed so now, to men and women. Right. So actually, it's sort of a radical, it sounds stupid, but it's sort of a radical reform at the New York City Department of Probation that almost everybody now refers to people as clients. 
there was a lot of eye rolling in the beginning, you know, and sort of like, oh, there they go, these liberals, you know, they want to treat everybody like people. Uh, but now it's really caught on to the extent that even when people from the National Institute of Corrections come to do trainings and they keep talking about offenders, they start correcting themselves because they know that in our culture now, we're beginning to really see people differently. So these are like small victories, right? Yeah. So I'm reading the, the third volume of the Churchill biography that just got published in the fall. One of the things that struck me about it was he says he won the war through language. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, if that war can be won through language, this war can be won through language. And part of it is what you're talking so about. How do, we, how do we reclaim the language? I also want to speak to that. Please. Yeah. At the Correctional Association, we've changed the language, and we refer to people, people who are incarcerated, right. people yeah. who are formerly incarcerated. We just did a big fundraising event. We called it People Before Prisons. I sat on a panel two days ago with the Deputy Secretary of Public Safety for New York State, and the entire time I kept referring to people who are incarcerated. Right. And she was saying people who are incarcerated. Um, it catches that, on, right? It does right. catch on. Does the catch um, on. commissioner who just retired from the commissioner of Department of Corrections and Community Supervision, Brian Fisher, always says the word offender. He thinks that's a step up from inmate or convict or criminal, and I guess you or could felon. debate that, offender. right, or felon. Or, or right. ex-offender, yeah. Right, yeah. and so I would say, uh, Brian, you know, let's try on Let's try on the word people. It's so amazingly radical, Brian. Just try it. And, <laughs> and so he would say, well, you know, Sophia, I think people, I, I think that the, the inmates like to be called offenders. So I said, well, I haven't heard the inmates say they want to be called offenders. <laughs> Let's try people. And so we want to on a panel together. And about halfway through the panel, he finally said, Sophia would tell me I should call people people, so I'm going to start doing that. And for the rest of his presentation, he was saying people who are incarcerated. When I you know, walked the tier, I asked the men who are inside. And so afterwards, I said, so how did that feel? He said, well, I guess now I know why I'm retiring. <laughs> you finally have gotten to me. But we really can change the language. And it is something else that I want to credit Eddie Ellis yeah. with, because he's the person that I first heard push this phenomena that we should use our language and that these other terms are dehumanizing and re remove human dignity. And that just and because- they're abstractions. They're often yes, not yeah. concrete. That people go to prison yeah. as punishment, not for punishment. And that we should never take away their humanity by referring to them or objectifying them by an event right. and always recognize that they are people yeah. just like no, we are. You know, it's interesting I think Eddie, 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 Eddie and I were working together and we started doing this language thing. People say, oh, it's so complicated to have to write formerly incarcerated person or person who did this or person who did that. And, and one of my pet peeves right now is sex offender. Uh -huh. I really can't stand it. And so I'm always saying a person who was convicted of a sex crime. First of all, there's a vast array. And these are the boogeymen in the system right now, frankly. Mm -hmm. But it's interesting how, you know, I said at, this was at a point, well, people didn't want to say men and women a few years ago. Right. It was too complicated. But I do think it's it's But it's only symbolic. complicated it's if people are wearing forest green uniforms. But if they're wearing mm. if they're not wearing forest right. green uniforms, then we find it very easy to say men and women. Right. Right. I also just want to um, say that you know Eddie 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 Ellis he, he changed the language, but he also he started off um, his project as a research project in prison where he had a hunch. You know his hunch was that everybody in his group you know came from seven neighborhoods in in, in New York City. And then Eric, who read, the paper, who read the story in the paper, thought, hmm, I want to test this out. You know, how do, we, how do we test this out? And of course, the only way to test it out is with data, right? And data is often seen as, you know, you were, you were saying before, Sophia, that it's usually used by the police, it's usually used by the courts, it's usually used by the, the people on the other side, right? But it's actually the only thing that we have um, that we can use in, in a new way. And it's actually a lot of what my book is about is repurposing data um, for your own advocacy reasons. And it's actually a responsibility that we have as a, as a society to take all that data that's collected and repurpose it for other, for other purposes that are much more useful and humane. Than, and humane than the reasons and the methods with which they are collected. And also, I'd like to argue 
not just in massive data collection, which you know yeah. is important. Right. And, and this is not publicly accessible data. Yeah. But I was in a meeting at the, the Penn Prison Committee. I didn't feel especially good or, or effective in any of the work. The numbers keep going up, and you mm -hmm. think when you're you know you're going to make a difference, and you don't see any difference happening. But we had a committee member named Joan Silver who said. We have all these pen members, we have all these manuscripts, why can't we write a note back to the people, at least the ones who show promise as writers? And I'm walking down the street later and I'm thinking, why don't we make mentors to actually set up a system to write back and forth with a manuscript? And so we started experimenting with that and we had 20 and then we did 100 and now we do 200. And we, they agree to correspond for three exchanges, and a lot of those parents, now I just made that up doing my laundry. Like, that's the kind of activism that everybody in this room is capable of, and that we all need to think about. And the other dream I have is I would like us to recognize that being a guard is a really, really difficult hardship kind of tour of duty. And we know some people like it, and we know some people do it for economic reasons, and we know there's any number of stories among the guards. But a lot of the challenge we face for education in prison or in trying to improve um, the hopes and chances of somebody coming out are the guards who are stuck there for 30 years till they get retired, and they don't really see any future in their own lives, and it is really a very stressful environment to work in. Talk about you know post-traumatic stress disorder. Many of them suffer from that. And why don't we have a GI Bill for people who work in the prison industry to recognize that it's damaging to both sides? And, and that's, that's something I say whenever I can. And I'd like to ask, um, why don't I start with you? If you had one thing you could dream about or wish, well, you can, you can do more than one, but why don't you well, go Well, I mean, first? I think one is um, you know, post-secondary education in prison and after prison, but quality education. It's got to be good. I mean, I particularly like the Bard Prison Initiative, which you know, it's Bard College behind bars, and it's liberal arts, people get AA and BA degrees, and it's really high quality. And who I, pays for those degrees? Bar, well, Bard gives the degrees. I mean, people have, they graduate with a Bard degree. And, and Bard, so Bard has done the fundraising no, to support No, well, Bard has done the fundraising, and it's mostly funded by the Soros Foundation and other I know that, funders. I'm just trying to get, okay. to, to get people to know, like, where to is go it to, It's from? much cheaper to go to Bard in prison than to go to Bard, because you, you have your housing paid for, and food. Well, and <laughs> so I think we have to change the sentencing structure seriously, and we have to also make it possible for people not to stay in prison so long. People must get out. They must not get their parole denied over and over and over again, often for one reason, the nature of the underlying crime, which of course is a static fact, which cannot be changed. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't really recognize that a person who came to prison at 19 and now you know he's 40, it's not the same person. And also the quality of your representation and the quality of your argument and the quality right. of who you're, you know, who right. you're addressing. So I think the, those are three big The arbitrariness of it. And Mark, I know, has a long list of and, others. Well, let's go to Laura next. What do you have on your list? <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stick with the city, right? Because I learned about this uh, project through being, through being an architect. And I, I think there's so many gaps that you keep reading about. Um, you know, it's in the newspaper all the time, the gap between the rich and the poor. I think if people knew their cities better, um, I think a lot, a lot could be different. I know that sounds hopelessly um, naive because there's all these people here working on policy. So I just think get to, know, get to know your city. Go to some of those neighborhoods that show up with bright red dots. I think you know, people who live in neighborhoods like this understand the incarceration system. The people who don't live in these neighborhoods don't understand the incarceration system. And that's it, you know. I think, I think it's quite stark. And go, to, and like go, to, go to 100 Center Street. Yeah, go to 100 like Center Street. It's a public space. It's in one of our, it's one of our civic public spaces. And I was teaching 16 to 18 year olds and they were so conversant. In, yeah. And they had all been incarcerated yeah. at least once. Mm -hmm. Boy, did they know the language. I was shocked yeah. at how, how much yeah. they knew. What would be on your list? Well, Susan says, yes, I have a hundred things on my list, but one of them is, uh, I think part of the problem is the sort of the dehumanization and the stereotyping that uh, frames our public policy discussion uh, about people in prison. Just quickly on that, 
A couple of problems, I think. One is that, uh, you know, in addition to all the other problems of the world of journalism, um, telling the stories of people in prison uh, has become, you know, almost non-existent. There used to be a relative handful of reporters and major newspapers that were supported. Uh, in many cases, uh, states have consciously tried to keep journalists out of prisons in recent years. So and access is really... The yeah. access is really important. And it's and different than it looks on television in the it's shows. Not, that not exactly. It's not the prurient uh, programming that we get right. about prisons. It's not that sort of thing. And on top of that, I well, along with that, um, you know, the stereotyping, we define people by the crime they committed. So, you know, in this prison we have 50 armed robbers, we have 20 sex offenders, we have 50 burglars and the like. And anybody who's ever been inside a prison, you spend any time at all talking to people there, what you find is that uh, a <clears throat> people in prison do not look like America. It's obviously very distorted by issues of race and class, but they are like America in that uh, these are very complicated people just like the rest of us. So they've done, in many cases, some very bad things in their lives. We've all done bad things. And they also have many good qualities that we could encourage to bring out. And so to tell the complexity of their lives and their stories would give us a very different conversation about how we could proactively deal with these issues. Great, thank you. Sophia? How much money do I get to do these things? Yeah, <laughs> as much as you want. Yeah. As much okay. as you want. Yeah. So I have a few things. One is I would create a documentary that would be shown on primetime TV, <laughs> and it would flip the demographics of who's caught up in the criminal justice system, who's incarcerated, and who's making money off of it. That would be the first thing, and it would be mandatory. You couldn't go to sleep, you couldn't wake up without seeing it. And I would just blast it, because part of the problem is that it's too easy for people to distance themselves. It doesn't affect them. And it doesn't affect them because it's affecting the other. But if you flip the demographics and you saw that um, 2.3 million people were incarcerated in the United States white. and 80 percent of them were white, America would shut down. And that's, what we, that's one of the things that I would do. Another thing I would do is... is Could the, be a feature uh, film, too, maybe. A, well, well, absolutely a feature <laughs> Science film. Science fiction. Yeah. Right. Um, another thing that I would do is that I would push hard for reliance on alternatives to incarceration. Part of the problem is that our knee-jerk reaction and solution to everything is to lock people up. And as opposed to looking, all of the, the research shows that alternatives to incarceration are far more successful in stemming the tide of recidivism than locking people up. And it's not surprising. Caging human beings is not likely to work. What are some alternatives? Time. Well, counseling programs, treatment programs, vocational educational programs. Um, college. <laughs> Right, college, there's a unique idea. It's so much cheaper to send somebody to college, and that's even frightening, because college costs so much. I've survived two, two um, kids going to college, but it's still cheaper to send them to college than to send them to prison. And so why would we invest all this money in caging people when the likelihood of success and long-term success is much higher by educating people? Mm -hmm. The other thing is I've represented countless people as a criminal defense lawyer my clients who got an education are doing so much better than those who didn't. So, of course, in our immaculate wisdom, we got rid of the Pell Grants and TAP Grants that help pay for education. So restoring those so people can get an education and providing a, a higher quality education for everybody from the elementary school level, I think would make a difference. I'm sure, um, I think, Laura, you, you did the research that, or maybe someone else did, that looked the same million dollar blocks are the same school districts yeah. that are the poorest performing throughout yeah. the city. Yeah. So the correlation is, is yeah. frightening. No, so I would, I would do my, film, my feature film thing. I would um, increase the use of alternatives to incarceration, and I would provide quality education at elementary school level and also, of course, for people who are inside. Yeah, because I mean, on the one hand, we yeah. need college in prison, but on the other hand, it's crazy that you have to go to prison, in some cases, to get to college. Right. It's just, you right. know. Oh, and I'm sorry, I left out something. I would, whatever power was left after I did those other things, is I would eradicate all the stigmas that are attached to people who have a criminal record, whether you're incarcerated or not. I would get rid of those stigmas so that you wouldn't hit all those obstacles that make it virtually impossible for you to be able to build a life for yourself afterwards. Yeah. 
you. And I'd raise the age of criminal responsibility so no 16 and 17 year olds would be prosecuted as adults. But I, I also Is that think, enough? Yeah, yeah, and the, other than um, uh, social services and, and that kind of thing, I think looking at the, you know, looking at the city and understanding what disinvestment means in these neighborhoods, you know, oftentimes, you know, I know this sounds really stupid, but rich neighborhoods have trees and poor neighborhoods don't. Um, rich neighborhoods have bike lanes and poor neighborhoods don't. There's, and to, there's to, to so, the thing and about the highway, that, that was so telling to me. About the, it, the, all these neighborhoods. That are, he's yeah, about. but they mostly, um, you know, I don't want to do a diatribe against the car because that, that doesn't work either. But a lot of these neighborhoods have been um, cut in half. A lot of the neighborhoods that were mostly, you know, very successful centers of black entrepreneurship were um, cut through by um, the highway, like the neighborhood I was studying in, in New Orleans. Um, you know, that's where disinvestment, that. that's where disinvestment starts, and a lot of these neighborhoods are extremely isolated, right? So you, there, there's some incredible, um, simple urban questions that can be addressed that don't cost that much. An after-school program, you know, costs $25,000. Think how many things that kids can do after school, right? What is an after-school program? It doesn't mean they have to go clean up the neighborhood, but they, there's all kinds of things that they could learn that keep them, you know, that, that encourage them to do different kinds of things. So I don't know, I just think there's so many things you can do at a much smaller scale and nimble, um, nimble idea of, of, you know, real architectural ideas in, in the city that could help. Jackson, can I throw up one more, yet one more radical sure. idea? Is that is that all of the, the decisions about who are going to be members of our police department would be made by the communities where those people are going to serve. So if you're going to be a cop in a particular neighborhood, you have to come from that neighborhood, oh and the mm -hmm. people in that neighborhood decide whether or not you become a police officer. That would make a That's huge a difference. Wow. Then you'd have, have to remove have to go some all of the, the parking from the police yeah. force, probably. So yeah. We could do that. <laughs> we can work on that, too. You wanted to say something? No. Or, no. no okay. Um, we are actually sadly out of time. We, this could go on for a long time. I want to tell you two yes. things before we leave. Outside on the table are two books for sale. One is Laura Kurgan's book, Close Up at a Distance, subtitled Mapping Technology and Politics. Please take a look at it. It's so, it's so amazing. And the other book I want to tell you is a graphic novel that was done on a, on a book that Mark wrote called The Race to Incarcerate, and this is a graphic retelling of his book, and I highly recommend that as well. It's so accessible and so fascinating. Um, both of those are amazing titles. The Penn American Center and the Penn Prison Writing Program thanks you very much for your attention, and I, as always, we thank our wonderful committee members for coming out and making a difference in people's lives. Thank you. <laughs>